All right, you're very welcome along. It's Thursday morning. It is the 22nd of June. It's half past seven. You're very welcome along to Off The Ball AM. Uh, we are here all the way through until 10. If you want to get in touch with us, you can get us on 087-918-180. That's the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always get us uh, on youtube.com forward slash Off The Ball. I'm getting uh, dagger eyes there from Colm. Whoa. It's like a bomb went off. Colm, good morning to you, but you're not actually here, so you can't, no one can hear you. He's waving through the glass. Mm. Shane, how are you? How are things? Good morning. Kathleen's here as well. Kathleen, how are you? Morning, morning. I'm good. So, officially the nerves. I, I'm going to let you be nervous from this point forward, Kathleen. Oh, thank you. You're so it was, kind. It was too early. <laughs> it was too early. You were like a kid six weeks out from Christmas, getting very excited about what Santa was bringing. But Santa's officially mm. starting the visit tonight with Ireland against Zambia. Uh, this is properly the kickoff of the World Cup. Yeah, it is. Well, for me, it probably felt like I started with the announcement of that first provisional squad, but tonight is the first time we get to see the players on the pitch. We get to see, you know, what Vera is going for. She said yesterday in her press conference that today is kind of for the players who maybe haven't had a lot of minutes or the players who are looking to prove something. It's not necessarily for your Katie McCabe's, um, who, like, she's probably not playing tonight anyways according to Vera yesterday because she only came into the squad on Monday but tonight is a night for your Leanne Kiernans and stuff to prove what they can do uh, there was a little 11 v 11 open training session last Friday that uh, we were able to attend was there 1500 people at it? yeah that was the one in UCD yeah yeah so that was that was a fairly amazing thing that um, I saw a photograph of it and I was like that's uh, people got tickets who were I don't know what the oh, what the allocation was, but it was taken up immediately. Yeah, I think it was mainly to like just by looking at the crowd, like it was quite young, so it was mainly to clubs and schools that the tickets were gone to. But like fair play to the FBI, they actually did put on a really good show. You know, like there was a DJ there. They had the little activity book that they've put out around the World Cup. They were handing those out. They had little autograph books for all the kids that were there, so that after the match and after the training session, um, the kids lined up around the pitch and the team went around the entire pitch and signed as many things as they could. We didn't it, speak uh, about the activity book, but it's an incredible initiative where it's encouraging kids to go to their local libraries and pick up a free World Cup activity book, which has like uh, fact files and uh, colouring. And as far as I know, it's in every library. Certainly if you ring your local library, there's a, a chance to go down and pick them up and they're free. And it's one of those initiatives that's like uh, promoting sport and reading. And you're like, oh, this is a very good idea. Yeah, and I think there's a digital version of it as well because I <laughs> I was doing a podcast with uh, an Australian podcast yesterday who wanted to see, you know, what what are Ireland thinking no about secrets. us? secrets? You didn't get any secrets? No, no, no. All the state secrets remained. It's actually my... I did another one this morning, so the Australians are very keen to hear Jeez. what we were thinking at the moment. Yeah, we want to keep the ball kicked out to you at all. <laughs> but uh, the podcast... You can use your hands, can't you? <laughs> the podcast recording was delayed by five minutes because one of them was really enjoying the crossword and the word search. That's <laughs> the activity book so you know it's not it's not just for kids Mm. Uh, the sticker book's out as well, isn't it? The, the official, yeah, or is there an official World Cup sticker? If book? anyone has found one of these, can they please tell me where they found them? Because I have searched high and low across Dublin, and I cannot find them. And I've asked my parents and, and like family in various parts of the country if they see one to pick one up, but uh, they're like gold dust. That's so. the best part of the World Cup. I know. I want to start collecting my stickers and getting excited. Although I suppose it's a bit weird being out so early because a lot of the squads aren't really set yet. So. It'll be interesting who who is there for the Irish ones. Um, but yeah, sorry, what I was saying was that at the 11 v 11 last week, Leanne Kiernan was the only person to score. So I'd be very intrigued to see how play Vera plays her tonight uh, because she definitely is one of those players that needs game time and needs the opportunity to prove herself a little bit. When you say someone needs game time, there's two aspects to that. Somebody needs game time to be in in contention for minutes in the World Cup and then there are some who need game time to prove that they're worthy of their place on the plane so how big is the squad at the moment how many people are going to miss out uh, so the squad's 31 at the moment but that's not including the four US based players so they come in I think next Thursday um, and then it has to be brought down to 23 ok so 35 down to 23 12 people are going to be very disappointed Ugh. that's a tough conversation isn't it I mean naturally enough but how do you even engage that conversation? I suppose from Vera's perspective, she's had these discussions before. Mm. Like it's it's never an easy job for a manager. That's like, I suppose what she gets paid for. But yeah, there's a lot of disappointed well, players it was, there. Yeah, it was interesting. She was saying when she announced the provisional squad that she made over fifty phone calls in one day, telling people that they either had made it or they hadn't made it, um, because there are quite a few people there on the wings who maybe thought mm, might get a chance with the provisional squad. Um, 
and that there was one point where she just had to take a break in the middle of it and just put the phone down and walk away and she said like her husband or someone asked her was she all right and she was like I just I actually can't talk to anyone else it it was quite emotionally taxing um but I think we have a clip as well of her talking about say next week when she has to tell the players and how it's tough for her but it's going to be a lot worse for any of the players who don't get on the plane yeah Jesus that's roll it there Roisin I emailed Nat, text message Nat. Uh, the first group I had to call, unfortunately, because physically I couldn't go there. But of course, this will be face to face. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's been written a lot about that because I've said something about that. Uh, and it is something that I'm really nervous about. Uh, that, I think that's all that I should say about it because it's for them so much worse than for me. And um, the, the fact that this is coming up, that gives me sleepless nights. Yeah. It is, but that was also in, in other tournaments. I know that I'm going to break dreams. So that is not a nice feeling. You wouldn't want to be in her shoes next week, you have to say. Mm. At the same time, right, we, we do seem to have quite a bit of doubt about a few positions at least, so there's a lot up for grabs this week, and that's why these games really matter to those people who need the minutes, right? Somebody is going to put in a good performance, and somebody's going to have a mistake or just not be at it, and that'll be the last thing in her mind when she's sitting down and going, you're in, you're out. Yeah, she was asked about that yesterday as well and she was saying because they actually have so much time together as a squad, like obviously tonight is important because it's like competitive minutes and you're not playing against each other, that she's seen a lot from certain players in training that maybe she didn't expect or not, she was like, I didn't expect is the wrong word, but that she was surprised at how much players were putting into everything. It just seems to be like a generally good atmosphere around the squad at the moment. Chloe Mustaki was asked, you know, is there a bit of tension between everyone because obviously you're all vying for the same positions and she was like to be honest no we're such a tight knit group like we've all been friends and been through so many things together for so long that you just know that next week you're either gonna have to like take a moment to celebrate the people around you or else take a moment to make sure they're lifted up if they don't get in but yeah like you were saying I think most people aren't that like I think the there not that many people are that confused about the starting eleven. It's kind of past that where things go. So that's why tonight will be interesting in terms of positions, who gets on the pitch, who doesn't get on the pitch, um, and what that means for the announcement next week. So it's kind of the last time we get to see them on the pitch. I don't think there's any open training sessions or anything next week ahead of the announcement on Thursday. And then the France game is when's the France game? It's the following. sixth. Yes, yeah, this following week. And that will be our first team? Most likely. For I at would least think a portion so. of it? Yeah, at least for a portion of it anyways. Um, it's the big send-off. Like, obviously, you don't want to run anyone ragged or risk any mad injuries at that stage, but I reckon it'll be as close to the first team as possible. Yeah, that's the balancing act. You've got to get minutes into them at as high intensity as possible in the kind of the rhythm so that they have their touch is not like the men's team's touch uh, for the first yeah for the game like it'll definitely be important for say the championship players who've been off for I think 8 weeks maybe more 10 weeks now whereas the likes like Katie only just finished up Denise and the American players are still playing at the moment so they'll be fairly match fit um, so definitely for that side it'll be really important the choice of Zambia that's pointedly uh, like Nigeria this is the same attacking style of play it seems to be a very much uh, let's get ready for that game yeah I think so like Vera has said all the way along that she chooses her opponents for very specific reasons um, Zambia also beat Nigeria last year in AFCON and Nigeria are like absolutely it's like one of three I think that they haven't actually won over the years I think they're nine time champions or something so they know what they're doing against Nigeria it'll be It's hard with these teams because there's actually so little video or so few of the games that are accessible to watch to properly assess the teams. Um, Like we did an episode of Quiggig where we reviewed all the opponents in the group and I was on Nigeria. And apart from a few international windows where they played the likes of the States and New Zealand where, you know, those federations took it upon themselves to release highlight clips, there was very little about them. Um... But it was interesting, Vera said yesterday that Tom Elms in particular, who also worked with the under 16s, he's been concentrated fully on the senior squad the last while. Um, he took the responsibility of like gathering footage and gathering 
all the information about um, Ni- or Nigeria and Zambia so that the team would be properly prepared. So hopefully they have seen a lot more than I have of the squad. But definitely, I think tonight isn't so much about our opponents or what it prepares us for the World Cup. I really do think it's about the individual players and getting those minutes, whether it's that they haven't had a lot of them or yeah. that they need to prove themselves. Yeah, Chloe Mustaki obviously was doing press yesterday. What was the general tenor from that? Um, she was quite optimistic. She said she was feeling good, that she'd had you know a really good season in terms of Bristol making it up into the uh, WSL and the fact she got a new contract, so she's going to be playing in the WSL next year. Um, and I, I actually asked her a question about whether there was any extra added tes- tension or pressure on tonight because when you think about it this is kind of it's a friendly against Zambia and on a routine day it doesn't mean all that much but it's possibly one of the most important games and definitely the most important one we've played since maybe the playoffs for a lot of players in this team because as you said earlier Jer, it's your final chance um, so I think we have some video of her answering that question and Chloe, like obviously tomorrow's technically a friendly, but in some ways there's more riding on it for the individual players than, than many other games we've played before. How are you approaching that, I suppose, like mentally in terms of your prep and making sure that you're in the right place to show to beer and the rest of the team that you, you really want to spot in that play? Yeah, probably no different to be honest. Like, I'm lucky in the sense that I'm playing full time, so I'm kind of used to approaching every game the same way. Um, So yeah, just preparing well, knowing the game plan and doing the best that we can, I can on the night and hopefully that's enough. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously there will be a few changes to the core team um, and we're still only kind of in week two. So we will be a lot more prepared for Australia in a way in terms of our connectivity on the pitch than we will be maybe tomorrow with a few different changes. But that's just the way it is and that's the process you need to go through to make sure that you know your best 11 um, for our game against Australia. Uh, is she going to be first choice when the team is named for the first game of the World Cup? Um, I don't, she's one of the players for me that's still slightly on the edge. I think she'll be on the plane, but I don't know if she'll be in a starting position um, at the World Cup. You can't put her out for a press conference like that and sit beside the manager and then not put her on the plane, right? Like, uh, if I was in her shoes, I'd be like, oh, I'm on the plane. <laughs> well, you would think that, that, but also, so the way they have this set up is that we basically get access to nearly every single player. But not in beside the, the manager. Squad. Well, we at a press conference and the manager's talking about breaking hearts. Yeah, not yours. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I know, but also, say, like, uh, they've had someone like Abby Larkin did, like, the when the World Cup trophy was here and stood beside Vera and chatted to Vera about whether she would have her place on the plane and stuff. There has been quite a lot of these sort of events, and I know it's a week out, so maybe that changes things a little bit, but yeah, I mean. I, I don't know if she'd be a starting player, but she probably would be on the plane for me. Has she got better since going full-time? Yeah, definitely. You can definitely, just even in terms of like agility and her strength on the pitch, you know, she has had an, an incredibly tough couple of years and I'm sure most people know her story, but she... Have she gave up a full time job twelve months ago? A very like a, a decent job, you know. She I think she halved her salary to go full time with Bristol, who were playing in the championship at the time. They managed to get promoted to the WSL this season. She signed a new contract, uh, and I don't think she would have signed a new contract and gone up to the WSL if this had happened a year ago. Yeah. I think it's a testament to how hard she has worked, and she even said it yesterday. She uh, I, actually, sorry, it was in that clip there that you know for. Her her she can even feel the difference in her game the fact that she is playing consistently at a higher level than she ever was before and it was one of the best decisions that she made so yeah I think when you look at the Chloe Mustachi of a year ago and the one that out on the pitch now there's a definite difference and there's even just a confidence in the way she plays that I don't know was there before possibly because she was on and off the pitch so much how did Bristol use her? um I use her either on the wing or in centre half, so kind of a mixture. Uh, she hasn't really settled on like one particular position in that squad. She's kind of been moved around a little bit because they, they had quite a few injuries this season. And where would Vera prefer to use her? Hard to know. She generally plays a bit higher up the pitch whenever it's with Vera, so I imagine 
You wonder does that stand uh-huh. to a player being that versatile? Sometimes it can it can go the other direction, do you know, and mm. Bears making a decision as to who's in the squad. Obviously, it's useful and you could be a utility player if you play in different positions, but also maybe sometimes it, it's better to be a, a specialist. Yeah, I think with the way that Ireland squad is set up, we generally need players that can do a couple of different things. Mm. Um, we don't have players who play at a high enough level by and large. Like, obviously, you have your Canadians, your Denises, your goalkeepers who have to play at a certain position. But uh, I think for the rest of the team, it's quite important that you're versatile. You look at someone like Megan Connolly. You know, she can play midfield. She can play on the wing. She can play in a back four. It, there's lots of different positions that we've required of players like her over the last few years. So I don't think the versatility thing will be too much of a worry for Vera. Okay, we're going to come back to this in 15 minutes. One one last clip from Chloe Mustaki here talking about her old job and um, going pro. Yeah, it's been a pretty intense 12 months. 12 months ago, I walked away from a full-time job. So a lot has happened. Um, So for me, personally, whatever happens in the next week or so, like I can just be happy and proud with what I've achieved in the past 12 months. Um, But it's been fantastic. And having gone through a bit of a difficult time this season, I'm glad to just be involved at the moment. Um, I'll fight for my place to the last day, of course, but um, I need to remember the bigger picture and I was out for quite a while. So, but no, it's been fantastic. And as I said, I was working a full-time job up until this time last year. So it's been an amazing whirlwind 12 months and that night in Hampton Park, I'll never forget that. So and without a shadow of a doubt, the togetherness. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's in our DNA, I think. And the support that we have for each other is unwavering no matter what. And um, we have such a big age gap between kind of the younger girls and the older girls, and you wouldn't even be able to tell. Like everyone's lovely to each other, everyone's supporting each other uh, on the pitch as well. The communication has grown a lot over the past kind of 12 months or 18 months as well. So yeah, it's just it's great to see, and yeah, well, hopefully, um, hopefully girls will be able to look past being disappointed potentially next week. But yeah, probably the togetherness. I know you said that people will be familiar with the story. Lots of people won't be familiar. When she was 19, she had Hodgkin's lymphoma and she's now, in the last two weeks, I think, um, tweeted that she's uh, an ambassador for breakthrough cancer research. Um, so it's one of those incredible stories where somebody comes back from um, a, a really terrifying condition and later represents Ireland and has also come back from ACLs. Yeah, it's interesting when she talks about the ACLs because she says that that was almost worse than the cancer because it was a first, there was like a acceptance when she had the cancer that there was very specific things she had to do and she didn't, she probably felt worse then whereas there was a frustration that came with the ACLs and a much tougher mental battle. Um, so yeah, it's, and I suppose as well when you've been hit down once and then you get hit down again, the second time is always a lot worse. But uh, I mean, she in that time she became a pundit for a TE. You know, she got this great job. She really is uh, one of those characters on the Irish team who's in, showed incredible mental strength to get to this place. Yeah, a high achiever. Yeah, there's some good podcasts with her. I think was it Nathan or Joe did a really good chat with her when she was making her return uh, on the off the ball feed. The um, show is live this evening from Tala. You're heading out. Yep, me and Nathan are going to be out there. So we are doing the news round I think with Richie later and then we will be providing live updates throughout the evening and then also of course there'll be loads of content uh, this evening and tomorrow morning on the podcast feeds and on social media with chats with players and post-match reaction and 7am tomorrow morning for the latest episode of Koi Gig yeah well it's being recorded at 7am tomorrow so it'll probably hit your feeds about an hour or two later depending on how fast our producer Catherine uh-huh. is but uh, oh. I'll also be back in here so you guys can chat to me as well <laughs> it's uh, 7.50 OTVAM is live with Gillette Labs got the ultimate shaver your money back neon edition is available now here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock Sue Ronan is going to join us at 8 Patrick Horgan is going to talk to us at 8.20 John Duggan at 8.40 we've got James Tracy with you had to be there at 8.55 and then we'll play a half an hour of a pretty exceptional interview with Vincent Hogan who has stepped away from the Irish Independent as their chief sports writer after an illustrious career he was in studio yesterday speaking with Joe Malloy the whole thing is about an hour and 20 minutes and you can get that in your OTB daily feed it's also in the OTB GAA feed uh, if you're only a subscriber to one or the other then really you should uh, sort yourself out and subscribe to both of them um, some of the things we need to talk about the Republic of Ireland centre backs at the moment it looks like are likely to be on the move 
Yeah, it's. I think it's important that they get a bit of bit of game time. Um, and, and like, you, you look at you look at the centre halves we used to have Premier League starting centre halves, the likes of Richard Dunn. Like, you, you need to be playing week in week out. Nathan Collins is one, I guess, who's at least got a little bit of game time. Um, but yeah, to see them, to see a couple of players that are potentially on the move is so. What's positive. the story? Well, it's Dar O'Shea, isn't it? That that appears to be heading heading off. Um, so he, like. It, I guess the West Brom version of Darrow Shea, you were like, you were like, well, at least a little bit of game time. Um, you want to see players at least play in the championship as well. Uh, he was a he was a regular. He was captain on and off over the course of the season. Yeah, um, but, but then you look at some players like Jason Knight who are playing League One football and they should probably be playing in the championship. Uh, but Dara heading to Burnley, Vincent Company, like. I mean, not a bad centre half to learn from. I think it's great. So, so he has Premier League experience. Played twenty eight times for West Brom before they came down. And uh, talking with Phil and Stephen in the um, in the office yesterday, they were both making the point that he was exceptional in big games. And he's going to start his career at Burnley with a big game because they got Manchester City on the first day of the season. Not bad. Yeah, and if Company is making you one of his first signings as they're coming up, then that would indicate that he'll play. Um, and they did play with a flat back four last year we could do it players playing in flat back fours as opposed to um, in threes and the other thing that's happening is Nathan Collins has been the subject of two bids Mm. which have so far both been rejected by Brentford Um, uh, the bids are by Brentford Uh, they've been rejected obviously by Wolves but Wolves are in desperate dire financial straits and Lopetegui clearly has not wanted him as one of his first choice defenders now he did play the last two games of the season but I think that was just like give me a bit of game time here we're, we're safe and they were checking what they've got they'd be getting their money back a year on after what they paid for him and maybe making a profit of a million or a million and a half was the second bid so hopefully uh, Thomas Frank is wedded to him and is, is desperate for him and is going to stay there it looks like he probably will there's no other massive jobs available at the moment um, and I think that'll be a great move for him. Like, there are footballing sides who, uh, despite being overmatched, like to play front foot football. Mm. That's kind of what we need from Ireland's Ireland players. Yeah. And Collins is good on the ball. I think, like, he, he, I think he's proved himself at Premier League level, hasn't he, Nathan Collins? Like he, he got dropped. Yeah, he had, well, he had a difficult second half of the season. Yeah, but that's but, that's like so. This is a hairy moment. Yeah, but he, like the fact that even Brentford are showing interest, I think, will do wonders for his confidence. Like, and a manager like Thomas Frank, if someone's coming in for with bids like that, I mean, you'd hope that he gets that move, and, and hopefully, from an Irish perspective, he gets it. But um, like, he's still in a prime age, like Nathan Collins. He's he's literally at that age now where he wants to be playing Premier League week in week out. Yeah, he's only twenty two. Like, uh, the this is the first tiny setback that there's been in his career. Like, I think if uh, everything had progressed the way we thought it was going to be, he'd be in he'd be being spoken about as a potential. Uh, he'd be being bought by Wolves uh, by teams who are better placed than Wolves and actually in a way that's what's happening here mm. like Brentford are still unfashionable but incredibly well run and yeah, I don't know maybe they can have a similar season next season to this season and if they do ninth or something was it this year yeah yeah I mean, yeah, if, if we have more Irish players at those mid-table Premier League teams, teams pushing for Europe, I, c- I know it's a lot to ask for at the moment, but Nathan Collins is certainly one of those. You, you think when you look at the Irish team sheet that, that will be getting that get game time. And see Darrow Shea getting that move as well, by the way. Like, that's that's amazing. Um, y- you kind of see some players who, who get stuck in the championship doldrums and maybe end up as a championship player for their entire careers. But if, if he's getting an opportunity to come back into the Premier League and hopefully get some game time as well, I know maybe Vincent Company is probably thinking we just need to bolster up the squad have some options in the centre of defence as well but if Dara can burst his way into that uh, that Burnley team and uh, and get regular game time next season that uh, can only be a good thing from, from our perspective it's so. also the thing of like you can't get on the pitch unless you're in the team as well so yeah. like even the fact that he has the opportunity to go there learn from company show him what he can do you know there's a, there's a lot more chances to start some Premier League games than there is if he stays with West Brom, he also seems like a, a tough taskmaster. Like the company mm. takes no prisoners. You see that clip of him in the dressing room laying into players. It was one of the documentaries, wasn't it? Was it Burnley that went back to training like super early? They had like already yeah. some of their preseason was already done. I think it was Burnley, and I was like, Christ. Yeah, you give them risk. a couple of weeks. <laughs> give the lads a bit of a break, Jesus. Um, so yeah, it, it's 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 definitely positive from an Irish perspective, and even heading into those internationals later in the year, the more players we have playing football. I it, know that'll be early in the season, but still. Yeah, I did think Nathan Collins talking about Lock Bategi last week was quite interesting in that you probably 
maybe bitter is the wrong word, but you maybe expected him to have a bit of anger, a bit of frustration at the fact that he didn't get as much game time this season as he possibly wanted. But he was actually very reflective on the whole thing and said that on the outside, like, yeah, okay, it was tough at times, but he learned a lot and it's not the, there's no animosity between him and Lapidé because mm-hmm. despite him not playing him, he was actually helping him in a lot of other ways in terms of uh, training sessions or you know conversations off the pitch so yeah it's the, an interesting one those bids as well so the the first bid apparently that Brentford made for, for Nathan Collins was £20.5 million pounds. that matched exactly as you said Gerard what Wolves paid Burnley for him a year ago and then the second bid went up a million and a half to £22 million quid. again rejected uh, Wolves have these financial fair player regulations as well that they have to sell players Ruben Neves uh, is already gone to Saudi Arabia for a reported yeah. £47 million pounds. Yeah, close to fifty. So, um, like, <laughs> they're probably going to have to sell him. Uh, I don't know how many more bids Brentford and Thomas Frank are ready to table, but you would hope, from an Irish perspective, that uh, the next one is the the one that gets through. Yeah, and that this isn't a saga, and that it doesn't take all preseason, and that he's not left in limbo a little bit. And you know, because that that could easily happen here. So, um, very quickly, just going to run you through the front pages of the papers. It's all it's all Vera Pau and the back pages uh, and the front pages of the sports sections. Running the rule: last chance for fringe players to book World Cup flight Tommy Martin is asking if Liam Brady has fallen out of love is football truly gone it was one of those things that Brady was on uh, the radio after he announced his retirement for a short interview and he just said I've fallen out of love with the game I was like that's pretty pretty depressing really isn't it McKay benched as Pow gets ready for the final reckoning the drop quote here is let me be clear I'm very happy in Ireland everybody can see that I want to stay so uh, contract negotiations have officially been paused is that the, the line yeah, that seemed to be what Vera was saying yesterday, that she was fully concentrated on the World Cup for now and that she didn't want anything to take focus away from that. Uh, stand up for the girls in green is the back page of The Sun. Ireland versus Zambia, half seven tonight. And call back again, B's 22 million Nathan bid is rejected. So that was the story we were just talking about. And the Daily Mail have changed their line from yesterday when it looked like um, there was a debate about whether or not Stephen Kenny would be in charge for September. But today, they're certain that he will be in charge for September. FAI hold fire, Kenny poised to get green light for September, uh, which I think was always fairly obvious. No one's going to uh, change the manager in advance of the games against France and Holland. It wouldn't make any sense. Like, even in a badly run organisation, which the FAI no longer is, it wouldn't make sense to get rid of a manager and put somebody new in to get the team spanked twice with anyway never made any sense mounting costs United talking tough after a 58 million euro bid for Mason is dismissed mm. Man United on the phone just to add an extra 10 million literally like saga it's going to be another saga isn't it that's going to drag on but it, it sounds like personal terms have been agreed uh, Mason Mount does want to leave so um, yeah you'd expect that one to go through in the next week or so but it's football and it's magic shed and it's transfer so anything can happen <laughs> uh, I think it all got swept under the carpet this is called Dennehy's story here with Olympian Jack Woolley on the attack that left him needing plastic surgery I don't know if you all remember but mm. um, Jack Woolley was on a night out and I think he was walking across one of the bridges yeah. in town um, when he got kicked in the face and he, he posted horrific pictures of it it was a random attack and he's making the point here in an interview with Carl Dennehy in the Irish Independent today that nothing came of it he never heard back there were no prosecutions on it and um, yeah it's pretty it's not you know it's pretty scary it's not great that nothing has come of it it's not great that uh, it just completely disappeared he's focused on qualifying for the Olympics in Paris and um, apparently it's much harder to qualify now than it would have been previously the top six in the world rankings are in an automatic place he is currently sixth but five, six, seven, eight are all really tight. So we wish him all the best with that. Um, I just want to take a moment. Uh, so Anya aims to top the class. This is the front of the T to Green section in the Irish Independent. And it's Anya Donegan, who is from uh, Clare, uh, plays out of Le Hinch, but also plays out of LSU, is the second Irish golfer who's qualified for the US Open after Leona Maguire. So the two of them are going to be playing in the US Open in a couple of weeks' time. She's back in Ireland. She's an amateur, obviously, at the moment, playing in college. And, uh, and her family are very, very proud because uh, she's my cousin's daughter and it's an incredible ah, story. Nice. Could Family have links. Also played football underage for Ireland. Could potentially have been playing in the World Cup squad if, right. if she hadn't decided to go off and become one of the world's best young golfers. So. One of these annoying people that's just good at everything. It's a tough life. Yeah. Making these hard decisions. LSU, by all accounts, is like one of the best places in the world to go to college. Mm. So, is, yeah. it, it's in, is it Baton Rouge or is it Louisiana? Oh, or it's, or I know Baton Rouge, Rouge is in Louisiana, but it's not in Louisiana New Orleans. Louisiana is the L for LSU, yes. so I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll find out. Baton Rouge springs It is in Baton Rouge. Is it only way up. 
Only way up is for O'Shea. Ireland defender poised for a move to Burnley. And Pow is facing a dilemma. That's about who she's going to drop. And um, pretty much Ilkay Gundogan is the other big story coming from the English papers. Off to Barcelona for two years with an option of a third. What a time to leave your club. Surely Man City need him. Unless now this means that Declan Rice is back on their agenda. That was the thing that the Arsenal fans were a little bit concerned about. That deal isn't done yet. Arsenal could have swept in, paid the price, and now it looks like maybe City are going to come. I don't know, maybe they don't want him. Uh, Arsenal sealed 67.5 million deal for Havertz. Kovacic to leave Chelsea for City in 30 million moves. So uh, that's column in my ear as well, going, oh, they, they, Kovacic, they don't need Declan Rice, but they're, they're different players. Mm. Kai Havertz to Arsenal, Kathleen, a fan of that? I'm not sure. Um, it's so funny seeing transfers like that. Like I remember working on his transfer when he first came to the Premier League. Uh, I think if Arteta thinks that he can get something out of him that previous Chelsea managers haven't managed to, then I think it could be really interesting. The XG is uh, not good. No, it's not. It's terrible. Um, and that's the thing that kind of scares me. I'm like, is this a lot of money to be putting out on a player who hasn't really proven himself in the Premier League? Especially when Arteta has been relatively smart, I think, so far with a lot of the transfers. Um, for that reason, I guess you kind of have to trust him, don't you? Well, see, that's the thing. And I know, like, Havertz has had his issues with various managers and stuff and in the way he has been played and that he hasn't really ever felt like he's meshed with that Chelsea team which is kind of understandable considering how much toing and froing there has been since he joined um, so maybe Arteta thinks he can develop him and he can get that XG up I'm sceptical at the moment of it and I just don't want it to be another situation where we're paying like 70-80 million for someone who doesn't return anything 